Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. And I uh, hope you're ready for another session of The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Yesterday, by the end of the broadcast, we were talking about the stark contrast between the government of the papal states, that is, those states controlled by the papacy, and the rest of Europe, which had liberated itself. The light of Christ had come to Europe, the Protestant Reformation, the reading of the Bible, the discovery that the Pope was the biblical Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, and they threw off their papal rule. They destroyed the temporal power of the Pope, and they, de and they elected governments of, by, and for the people. Uh, constitutional governments, republics. The republics replaced the repression and suppression and tyranny of Roman Catholicism as it controlled Europe. and But what was left was the Papal States. The papacy still carried the temporal sword in this small area of Italy known as the Papal States. And what we were doing yesterday was comparing and contrasting the state of affairs as they existed in the Papal States with that of the rest of Europe and how much like the Middle Ages, the Dark, the dark Ages was the Papal States in comparison to the rest of Europe. It was a contrast of contrasts. And the author wants to make this point clear. What a difference the world would be, would, would experience if the papacy once again wielded the temporal sword and ruled over the kings of the earth as he does today. And I want my listeners not only to recognize how starkly different and tyrannical were the papal states compared to the rest of Europe at that time, but to see in, these, in this evidence, in these examples given by the author, of just what the world will be like, and yea, already is like, when the papacy returns to its tyrannical form, the New World Order. Now, speaking of the papal states, the author writes, and if you're following along, it's the last full sentence on page 232, at the bottom of the page, it says, under this parental government, we're talking about the papal states now, the Pope is the parent. In other words, the sole sovereign of the papal states, a tyrant. Under this parental government, if a poor Italian should have written a word against a profligate priest who might have tried to rob his home of its most precious treasure, or should have been found with a Protestant Bible in his house, or a history of the American Revolution, or the life of Washington, or the Constitution of the United States, or the Declaration of Independence, he would have been arraigned before the Holy Inquisitor, punished as a criminal, shut out from the church by excommunication, and visited with the wrath of God for violating his divine commands." And this, several centuries after the close of the Middle Ages, after the world had been lifted out of darkness and into light. See the stark contrast that existed in the Papal States compared to the rest of the world, and particularly America, Protestant America. Now, the precise punishment of these several degrees of crime was not defined almost everything being left to the discretion of the Inquisition. Its general character, however, may be inferred from a document published in 1850 by the Cardinal Archbishop, Cardinal Bishop, and other archbishops and bishops of the Marches and of the province of Umbria, referring to the crimes of, quote, blasphemy, inobservance of the sacred days, profanation of the churches, 
and violation of fasts and immoralities, unquote, this edict fixes as penalties according to circumstances, quote, excommunication or imprisonment or fines or castigation or exile or even death, unquote. It provides that the names of the informer and the witnesses shall be kept secret. Now, this is, again, how life was like in the Papal States when the Pope ruled supreme and carried his temporal sword. This is the justice that was meted out in the Papal States. But keep in mind that when the papacy regains its temporal sword in the world, and I assert that it already has, these examples will be extant. These examples will be recognizable facts on the ground as they are also today. Okay? The, the punishment of these so-called heretics, uh, the law provided that the names of the informer those who ratted him out and the witnesses shall be kept secret so that the offender may never know who are, who are his accusers or have an opportunity openly to confront them and that half the fine should go to the informer and officers ex executing the law and the other half to the benefit of the holy places. So you're going to be denied your Miranda rights. You're going to be denied a right to a, a, a speedy trial by your peers. You're not even going to know who your accusers are. They're going to arraign you in secret. They're going to bring charges that you will never know of. And they're going to try you and convict you. And then when they after they convict you, they will have the right then to take your property and then give it to your accusers. Half of it goes to the, the accusers, and the other half goes to the prosecutor, the inquisitor. That's how it was in the Papal States. That's how it used to be all over Europe. And so people took advantage of this, seeking for no other uh, nothing else but riches would accuse a rich man of some heresy, have his accusations maintained privately, his identity maintained privately, and just simply wait around for the receipt of uh, half of the accused property. So there was a tremendous incentive to be an informer to work with the church and with the inquisitor to to turn in heretics. And if you had a grudge against somebody and you really wanted to uh, uh, exercise a vengeance against someone, just simply take them to the inquisition, go to the inquisition and make an accusation and watch the system work. You didn't have any rights. There was no justice under this law. And that's the way it's going to be in the New World Order. Now, he continues, he says, It is impossible in the, in the very nature of things that such a system of government as this could have been otherwise. And harsh, severe, and oppressive embodiment of tyranny. Can it be designed the human family to be subject to the perpetual curse of such rule as this and cut them off? by a divine decree from all possibility of its removal without sin? If he did, how happens it that it, he has not long ago, as he did with the pursuers of the Israelites, cast the revolutionary innovators, horse and rider, into the sea? In 1861, a large crowd assembled in the Corso and in Monte Sitorio had shouted, Viva Italia! Viva Vittorio Emmanuel! In other words, they were praising Victor Emmanuel for riding into Italy and liberating these people from this papal tyranny. They praised Victor Emmanuel. 
and it says they were immediately fired upon by the papal gendarmes. One of them was stabbed in the melee. For this, a man by the name of Locatelli was arrested and tried. Although there was no evidence identifying him with the transaction, yet he was convicted and executed. Even the president of the Sacra, uh, Sacra Consulta, when he presented the record of the conviction to the Pope, advised him, in view of the insufficiency of the evidence, to exercise clemency. But the Pope, who cannot sign a sentence of death, laid over this document the fatal black ribbon, and Locatelli died, shouting, Viva Italia! The cases of punishment by imprisonment and exile for political crimes are too numerous for, for detail and too horrible to be recited with composure. Dr. Butler mentioned some of the exceedingly cruel and uh, the, the exceeding cruelty and hardship where native Romans were banished for the suspicion of being opposed to the papal government. This class of criminals are specially sought after by the police who infest the country. That's right, it was a police state. There were police everywhere. Sound familiar? And it says, And so odious had this papal police become in consequence of the manner in which they broke in upon the most sacred privacy of the citizens that, quote, no Roman would enter into this hated service. No Roman would probably be trusted in it. It is made up of foreigners of various nations. Have you heard any rumors of foreigners becoming police officers in this country? People who, whose first language is not English? Have you heard of the uh, United Nations uh, Armed Forces, a mixture of nations? And they can go into any country in the world and turn it into a police state. They have no familial relationship to the people over whom they, they rule, and they have no national loyalty either. And that's how the papacy ruled the papal states with foreign police officers people that had no loyalty to the people of the papal states no loyalty to the papal states at all their loyalty was to the pope can you imagine every cop car in your town being driven by a foreigner that has no allegiance to anybody but the pope was not born in your country, does not speak your language, and only does what he's told. And what if perhaps this policeman, this foreigner, in his native country was a fugitive, a killer, a violent criminal, and was imprisoned in his foreign nation and was simply given clemency and let out of prison if he would serve the rest of his life in the United States of America driving a fancy police car, carrying a billy club and a, and a revolver and a shotgun with a German shepherd in the back seat. This is what took place in the Papal States. It says many of them are criminals and disbanded soldiers of Francis II. So detested are they by the Roman people that it is not considered safe for them to make arrests during the day. They are made at night or in the early dawn. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Religious toleration was unknown in the Papal States. English Protestants were permitted to hold their services only within the Porto del Popolo, and no Protestants whatever were allowed to do so within the walls of Rome. Quote, Gendarmes guard the door of the English chapel to see that none of the faithful 
that is, Roman Catholics, stray into those poison pastures, the poison pastures of the Protestants, unquote. In 1862, Protestant services were performed at the house of an American lady about 20 miles back of Rome on the Alban Hills. And upon being discovered by the gendarmes, it was broken up. The informer in this case was supposed to have been a man with whom it is related that he was a poor and humble citizen without any title, but that the Pope being once compelled to pass the night in his house, and it being derogatory to his official and personal dignity to, quote, sleep under the roof of an untitled citizen, unquote, he made the poor fellow a Roman noble before going to bed and slept with a good conscience. There can be no reasonable doubt that many of these measures of severity are to be traced to the influence of the Jesuits at Rome. It is well understood that all the machinery of the papal government was, uh, has been directed by them, that is the Jesuits, for a number of years. And their whole history shows that whenever they possess power, whenever the Jesuits possess power, it is employed with a single object only, to advance the interests and perpetuate the debasing principles of their order. An ex-priest, a Roman by birth, who was once curate of the Magdalene Parish in Rome, professor of theology in the Roman University and qualificator at the Inquisition, thus expressed himself, quote, from the listen to this, this is very important. From the period of the Council of Trent, now you've heard me call the counter the, the Council of Trent, the counter the bloody Counter Reformation Council of Trent, the Jesuit run Counter Reformation Council of Trent. Okay, here's why. Beginning with the quote, it says, From the period of the Council of Trent. Roman Catholicism has identified itself with Jesuitism, that unscrupulous order that has been known to clothe itself when occasion required with new forms and to give a convenient elasticity to its favorite maxim that the end is everything and all the means to attain it are good. In short, the end justifies the means." But by depending on the skillful tactics of the Society of Jesus, as the Jesuits are called, the court of Rome has been constrained to yield to its ascendancy, confide her destiny into its hands, and to permit it to, to direct her interests. And of this control, Jesuitism has availed itself in the most absolute way. It has constituted the most powerful mainspring, more or less concealed, of the whole papal machinery. It should ignite no excuse me, it should excite no surprise, therefore, in the mind of any man who does not believe that God designed mankind for perpetual bondage, that the Italian people were anxious to get rid of a government so opposed to the spirit of the age and the progress of the nineteenth century and that they did get rid of it as soon as papal infallibility was decreed and the French troops were withdrawn. It had not about it a single element of popularity, nothing to make a Roman citizen feel that he was anything but a serf, and nothing to stimulate him to a proper conception of his own character or that of his country. It was the last surviving vestige of the Middle Ages, and seems to have been providentially spared only that the people of Italy might be enabled to observe the contrast between it and the advancing modern, and I will insert the word, Protestant nations, until they should be fully enabled to strike down all the civil appendages of the papacy. It was such a union of church and state, and so complete a subordination of the state to the church, as demonstrated by all its workings how impossible it was to establish any form of political freedom where it existed. 
It stood among the nations like the fabled upas tree of the Javanese forests, emitting a poison which liberty could not inhale without dying. And thus, while we are able to comprehend the motives of the Italian people in desiring its overthrow, we can also understand why the, the encyclical and syllabus were issued. We're speaking of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, and why all the progressive, and I'll add the word once again, Protestant nations were arraigned for refusing to recognize all its wrongs and injustice as rightfully done in the name of religion. And this leads us in the regular order of our inquiries into an examination of the real origin of the temporal power of the Pope, that, there, that, that, that thereby we may be enabled to decide whether it is of divine or of human power whether it was, as Pope Pius IX alleges, conferred on Peter by Christ or has been a creation of fraud, intrigue, and usurpation. History on this subject is much confused, yet the truth may be discovered by patient investigation through all the myths and fables which have been woven into it. There's nothing in which ecclesiastical and secular historians better agree than that during the times of primitive Christianity, the spiritual and temporal jurisdictions remained distinct, in other words, separate, each exercising authority only over those matters which pertain to itself. In other words, a separation of church and state. It is difficult to account for or deny, excuse me, it is difficult to account for a denial of this except upon the ground of ignorance or mendacity. The distinction was preserved for a number of centuries, even in relation to jurisdiction over heretics, which more immediately concerned the church than anything of a mere secular nature. The most disturbing element in the early Christian church was Arianism, this was condemned by the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. because heresy was, in, was within the spiritual jurisdiction. But the Council did not undertake to prohibit the circulation of Arian books because that belonged to the temporal jurisdiction and was left to Constantine, the emperor, who did it by imperial edict. The Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D. condemned the heresy of Nestorius, but left the circulation of his books to be prohibited by the Emperor Theodosius. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 A.D. condemned the Eutychians for heresy, but the Emperor Marcion prohibited the circulation of their books. The Second Council of Constantinople in 553 A.D. declared... Eunomius to be a heretic, but the emperor Acadius suppressed his books by an imperial law. All these councils are recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as ecumenical and as having possessed the highest jurisdiction and authority of the church, a fact never authoritatively impeached until the decree of papal infallibility was passed by the late Lateran Council. Now all powers in the Pope. Now he is both priest and king, and he carries the temporal sword as of 1870 at the First Vatican Council. The author has just given us a list, not a complete list, but a very substantial list of the ecumenical councils held by the Roman Catholic Church to pronounce heresy upon various sects and beliefs and that the civil power, that is, the emperor acted independently, that there was no union of church and state in the early days of the Roman Catholic Church, that this was a, a late development in the Roman Catholic Church. And now he continues, he says, it will not do for a papist to say that these councils did not properly understand and define the true relations between the spiritual and the temporal power. 
and he presumes greatly upon the popular ignorance who asserts that they were changed until that result was produced by papal usurpations. Papal usurpation. The, 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 the author just defined the temporal power of the Pope, the kingly power of the Pope, to be a usurpation. And history clearly demonstrates this. Early on, there was a division between church and state, and the state ruled the church. Now it is the opposite. There is a union of church and state, and the church rules the state. Now, many books have been written to prove the primacy of Peter in both honor and authority as the foundation for additional assumption that Christ, in establishing his church, gave it an external hierarchical organization. That of necessity, he conferred upon this organization plenary authority over all matters of faith and morals. That supremacy is involved in this authority. That as the necessary consequence of this supremacy, all Christians must defer it and obey it. That the church was established and organized by Peter at Rome that he was its first bishop, and that all the subsequent bishops and popes of Rome in regular and unbroken line of succession have enjoyed the same supremacy and held the same authority held by Peter. All the arguments to support these propositions are made within a circle, varying only according to the learning and ingenuity of those who make them. They all assume the same postulates and reach the same conclusions, to wit, that the Roman is the only true church, that she alone possesses the organization instituted by Christ upon Peter, and therefore also the supremacy and authority conferred upon him, that she alone, through her infallible Pope, has the power to decide and define the faith and nature and extent of her own authority over all nations and peoples, and consequently, that whatever she shall decide and declare to be the law of God in the domain of faith and morals must be accepted and believed as such. These propositions have theological aspects, not necessary to be discussed here, but they are grouped together because they constitute the basis of that jurisdiction over spiritual and secular affairs by means of which the papacy has exercised its wonderful authority over the world. The thoughtful investigator cannot be expected in the present age to acquiesce in the justness and legitimacy of this jurisdiction unless he shall find it conferred by the teachings and example of Christ and the Apostles. And if, on the other hand, it shall appear to have grown alone out of leagues and compacts and concordats between popes and kings and the usurpations which invariably attend them, then he will be justified in regarding it as unwarrantable and illegitimate. And if it arose out of the consent of, excuse, excuse me, if it rose out of the consent of the nations, at a time when they were threatened with annihilation, as some assert, then the nations, now existing in the enjoyment of stability and progress, cannot be denied the right to withdraw their assent from such a measure of temporary expediency, if indeed they are under any obligation to recognize it at all, and more especially if it interferes with their stability and impedes their, their advancement. The papacy itself has often found authority in the divine law for giving its assent once withheld and from withdrawing it when once given in matters both spiritual and temporal. And if the nations of the 19th century, not desiring to turn back to the medieval times, shall find in its example justification for denying to those times the right to confer upon it authority to block up their pathways of progress and improvement, 
it ought to know that its acquiescence would be far more consistent with primitive Christianity than its present persistent and passionate resistance. We must accept all papal testimony upon these questions with many grains of allowance, for much the most important part of it has come from the manufactory at Rome. In other words, just created out of thin air with no substantiation. We have to accept on blind faith the assertion that the Roman Catholic Church is the church established by Christ and that Peter was given to be the rock and the foundation of the church and that the popes are the successors of Peter and that the whole world needs to bow to the vicar of Christ, the Pope of Rome. These assertions must be understood on blind faith alone because there's nothing substantiating them. Now, I'll continue. It says, For much, of the, most, uh, much the most important part of it has come from the manufactory at Rome and does not reach the dignity of proof. A distinguished Roman Catholic of Venice, the priest of one of, one of the papal orders, has given us a timely and necessary caution on this subject. The, quote, most learned Father Paul, unquote, referring to the extraordinary influence which the popes were enabled to acquire by means of the prohibition of books and the universal practice among them of not permitting the circulation and reading of any that did not teach obedience on the part of the people to the ecclesiastical power, says this, quote, but as there were already in God's church those who made use of religion for worldly ends, so the number of them is now full. Okay? People have always used religion for their own personal advancement. But no time in history has there been more who use religion for their own personal advancements. And no more, no greater example of this is the Pope. He, he continues with this quote. He says, These, under a spiritual pretense, but with an ambitious end and desire of worldly wealth, would free themselves from the obedience due to the prince and take away the love and, re and reverence due by the people, to draw it unto themselves. To bring these things to pass, they have newly invented a doctrine which talks of nothing but ecclesiastical greatness, liberty, immunity, and her jurisdiction. The doctrine was unheard of until about the year 1300. Neither is there any book found concerning it before that time. Then did they begin to write of its uh, uh, then they, they begin to write of it scatteringly in some books, but there were not above two books which treated of nothing else but this until the year 1400, and three until the year 1500. After this time, the number increased a little, but was tolerable. After the year 1560, now note the date 1560. This is after the Council of Trent, immediately after what, and during the Council of Trent. It says, after the year 1560, this doctrine began to increase in such manner that they gave over writing, as they did before, of the mysteries of the Holy Trinity, of the creation of the world and the incarnation of Christ and other mysteries of the, of the belief. And there is nothing printed in Italy but books in diminution of secular authority and the exaltation of the ecclesiastical. And such books are not printed by small numbers but by thousands. Okay, so after the Council of Trent, the authors of Roman Catholic books completely left off writing about the tenets of the Roman Catholic Church and just focused strictly on elevating the Roman Catholic Church 
and establishing its jurisdiction and its temporal power. That's all the church was about after the, Rome, after the Council of Trent. The Jesuit-led, bloody, counter-reformation Council of Trent. Rome had to establish herself as a power to be reckoned with all over the world. Never mind Christ, never mind the creation, never mind the crucifixion, never mind uh, anything about the gospel. It was all about power. Okay? Now, continuing with this quote, it says, Those people which have any learning can read nothing else. The confessors likewise know none other doctrine, nor to be approved of need they any other learning. Nothing but the power of the church. Okay? Continuing, he says, Whence comes in a perverse opinion universally that princes and magistrates are human inventions, yea, and tyrannical, that they ought only be compul uh, that they only by compulsion that they ought only by compulsion to be obeyed, that the disobeying of laws and defrauding the public revenues do not bind one unto sin, but only to punishment. And that he that doth not pay, he can fly from it, remains not guilty before the divine majesty, and contrariwise, that each beck of ecclesiastical persons, without any other thought, ought to be taken for a divine precept and binds the conscience. And this doctrine, perchance, in the cause of all inconveniences which are felt in this age, there once not in Italy pious and learned persons which hold the truth, but they are not suffered to write nor to print. Something comes written from another place, but presently it is prohibited. And little thought is taken of heretical books, especially uh, those that treat of the articles of faith. But if anyone comes that defends the prince his temporal authority and saith that the ecclesiastical persons are also subject to public functions and punishable if they violate the public tranquility. These are condemned books and persecuted more than others. They have gelded the books of ancient authors by new printing of them and taken out all which might serve for temporal authority." Unquote. This author wrote shortly after the death of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, and when, as appears from his statement, the papacy had been brought completely under the influence of their doctrines, uh, the, of the doctrines of that order. He is better known as Sarpi, and his history of the Council of Trent has been long accepted by the learned as a work of standard authority. He lived for some years in Rome when he enjoyed the confidence of the Pope, as he did also that of Cardinal Bellarmine, the great Roman Catholic analyst. And remember, Bellarmine is a Jesuit priest and historian. And it says, His evidence upon the subjects of which he treats is of such importance as to justify the foregoing long extract. And he is equally important authority upon another point, he also exposes the fraudulent methods employed at Rome to falsify history as one of the means of extending and perpetuating the supremacy of the papacy over the legitimate temporal authority of the nations. That's right. No one is a better distorter of history than the Roman Catholic Church. He informs us that Clement VIII, who was pope from 1592 to 1605, prescribed a rule making all writers of Roman Catholic books so subservient to the papacy that their books, quote, might be corrected and amended, not only by taking away what is not conformable to the doctrine of Rome, but also with adding to it, unquote. This, he says, was, the put, in, this was put in practice, and by means of it, books were fraudulently mutilated to make them support ecclesiastical usurpation when their authors designed no such meaning. 
as late as the 17th century, the Index Expurgatorius, the Index of Forbidden Books, printed by the authority of the Pope at Rome, contained notes of the places where many authors ought to be canceled. And this dishonest practice of altering the language and meaning of books was carried so far, says Father Paul, that, quote, at this present, at this present, in reading of a book, a man can no more find what the author's meaning was, but only what is the court of Rome's who hath altered everything, unquote. Now you know why we have copyright laws. It's a direct response to the liberality that the papacy took over the historians of the Roman Catholic Church who told too much truth. And they simply redacted in these books what they didn't approve and then added to the book to support the temporal power of the papacy and the ecclesiastics of the church. Just took wholesale license to molest everything that was printed derogatory about the Roman Catholic Church. This is where we get our copyright laws, and this is where we get liberty of the press. We get our rights because Rome used to abuse these natural rights. What our founding fathers had in mind was to correct those errors and to make sure that the papacy could never control this country, could never control the information that you get, that you might get the truth. And so far as we have the First Amendment right of freedom of speech, I reserve the right to criticize both the Pope and the King. That's why we have the First Amendment in the first place, to criticize the Pope and the King. And nowadays the Pope is in bed with the King, and the King in bed with the Pope, and they ought both to be condemned in the most authoritative language, language backed up by history and the Bible, wholly condemned for the beast system that it has become, to enslave God's people, to remove our voice from the public forum, to hide the sins of the Roman Catholic priest, and to hide the sins of the politicians who do her beck and call in this country. And so long as God gives me breath, that's what I'm going to do. Expose them and condemn them. And pray, God, that some of my listeners will begin to do their own research into these things and read books like The Papacy and the Civil Power, where the Pope never had an opportunity to redact or to rewrite. A book that was written under the protection of the First Amendment. It contains the truth that you'll rarely hear. And you certainly won't hear it in the mainstream media, and only rarely in the most devout Protestant church. Now, he continues, he says, There are very few exceptions in history to the rule that those who possess themselves wrongly and unjustly of the power to govern others are not apt to halt long at the means of preserving it. Machiavelli has been severely censured for having taught the doctrine that, quote, the end justifies the means, unquote. But it should be remembered in seeing for the proper interpretation of his motives that his prince was written not so much for the purpose of originating new principles of action, as to exhibit the nature and operation of those that almost universally prevailed in his time, and that when he, became, when he came to illustrate the effect of that doctrine, that, quote, a prudent prince cannot and ought not to keep his word except when he can do it without injury to himself, unquote, but should play the, quote, part of the fox, unquote, 
The example which serves his purpose best was furnished by the pontificate of Pope Alexander VI, whose whole life he characterized as, quote, a game of deception, unquote, and of whom he also said, quote, oaths and protestations cost him nothing. Never did a prince so often break his word and pay less regard to his engagements, unquote. He had before his mind the Jesuit influence upon the papacy and the princes of Europe, whose combined authority was directed to the accumulation of power in their own hands, no matter at what sacrifice by the people. It was this influence which molded the ethics of the papacy, and whether the odious principles of the Jesuits were deduced from the examples of former popes or fixed first in the minds of those of the 16th century by Ignatius Loyola and his Jesuit disciples is of no consequence in view of the fact that the temporal power of the Pope is shown by all impartial history to have grown out of the most stupendous system of fraud and usurpation ever known to the world. The steps which led to it were gradual and progressive. So far from its having a divine foundation arising out of any authority conferred by Christ upon Peter, it had its inception in the time of Constantine, to whom more than to all others the papacy is indebted for the origin of its most important immunities and privileges. He was the first to lay a foundation for the union of church and state, to mingle religion and politics together, and he did this not only in, to increase his own power, but the influence of the Roman priesthood, in return for the assistance they rendered him when he overthrew Maxentius, the reigning emperor of Rome. At the proper time, we shall see that the combined the combination of effort uh, 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 the combination to effect these ends was political, not religious, and that there was no thought of it serving any other purpose until the calling of the Council of Nicaea by Constantine himself without any agency whatsoever on the part of Pope Sylvester, for the ostensible object of suppressing the heresy of Arius, but for the real purpose of producing a closer and more intimate union between the imperial and the ecclesiastical power. Folks, that's the union of church and state. That council was called by Constantine for no other purpose than to strengthen the union of church and state, and it was done for political motivation. Now he continues, he says, Some of the papal writers are disposed to go behind the concessions made to the Church of Rome by Constantine and to search for the temporal power and the ownership of ecclesiastical property before that time. A book has lately been written in Germany, translated and published in the United States, enforcing this view by a variety of arguments. It is called The Patrimony of Peter, the Supreme Jurisdiction of the See of Rome, and it is said that Ignatius referred to it as a presidency of charity, when, as this author alleges, he assigned to the Roman Church supremacy over all the other churches. This argument, if it proves anything, proves too much for the advocates of the temporal power. For at the time that Ignatius wrote, all the churches of Asia and Africa were the owners of ecclesiastical property, uh, property equally, equally with that at Rome, and some of the Asiatic churches, as those at Jerusalem, Antioch, etc., had been such owners before there was anything like an organized Christian church known or even heard of at Rome. Sorry, we've run out of time. We'll come back tomorrow on Inquisition Update and continue our reading of The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. I'll see you tomorrow.